for us to follow on as we hear God's word spoke this morning. You'll find that there is a paragraph on the top of that page that I'd like to just share with you in preparation for us opening the scriptures this morning. Now, preaching this morning is our intern, Troy Sergi. Uh, he's no stranger to us. He has been here not just in the last couple of months, but he's been worshiping with us now for about a year and a half or so. I think there's a young lady here in this congregation that he's interested in. I think that's part of it. There's probably other reasons why you're here. Yeah. Um, Troy was born in 1998 in Marquette, Michigan, to Deb and Jeff Sergey. Uh, he is a 2016 graduate of Marquette Senior High School and is currently in his fourth year at Grace Christian University in Grand Rapids, where he is studying pastoral ministry. And so we're very, very thankful that he's been able to do his internship here uh, at Parkside. There's been a number of things that he has been able to participate in. It's been really fun to see him uh, get involved in our congregation. He's been visiting people from our congregation, home visits. He's also been doing some hospital visits. He's been teaching in our high school uh, class, and it's been a privilege to be able to partner with him over the last couple of months to do that. I know that some of you have heard him teach in the Super Seniors Ministry, and he's also done some youth ministry uh, activities teaching there as well. He's been attending our staff meetings last year. He was here not as an intern, but he took it upon himself uh, to join our staff, and our staff meets every Tuesday for our staff meetings, and then he was a part of our 11.30 to 12 o'clock prayer meeting that he was a part of. And again, he took that upon himself to do that. Uh, he's also right now attending the Baltima Institute of Bible on Wednesday night, which Pastor Craig and myself have had the privilege of being a part of up in Muskegon. And again, he's taken that upon himself to be a part of that Wednesday night study where we have been able to do some things there and starting an institute, Baltima Institute, uh, up in Muskegon. He just also attended the Grace Gospel Fellowship Roundtable Summit that was down in Chicago, and it was, sounds like it was a very good, good experience for him as he participated uh, in those activities. I have to tell you that it's been a real joy to get to know this young man. It's also a joy for us as a congregation to allow these kinds of experiences for people to have some of those first experiences of preaching. If you're a preacher and some of you are here, you know what it's like to preach, but sometimes that first experience will go down in history as one that we'll remember for a long time. And I trust that it will be a great experience for you, Troy. It's been a real joy for you to be a part of our staff. Continue to preach the word. Continue to love him and his people and his word. Mix all of that together and work out your call wherever God calls you. And be faithful to that end. Jeremiah preached for 27 years and nobody listened. Know that if people don't listen, you still share the scriptures and you share Jesus Christ. May God bless you as you share the word. Let me have a word of prayer with you this morning. Father, our thanks for this young man and pray that you would guide him and bless him. And thank you for the preparation that he has done. As we now, Father, share the scriptures, may your spirit speak on behalf of your son to bring us to him. And pray a blessing of grace upon not just this day for Troy but for the weeks to come. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Gary. I've enjoyed the past couple of weeks, month and a half, enjoying listening to Pastor uh, Gary and Pastor Joe preach about Galatians 5 and diving into the scriptures. I pray that you have been diving into the scriptures and looked at Galatians 5 and have seen how the Spirit of God has worked in that passage and as well as your own personal life because Galatians 5 is a rich passage with many things that are in it, and we're able to look at Galatians 5, put it to our lives, and put it to practice, and I can tell you from personal experience, the results will show, the results will show with the Spirit of God living within us, that this is the true Word of God, and that this is applicable to our lives today. On May 20th, 1927, Charles Lindbergh became the first person to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. As he took off from Roosevelt Field in Long Island, New York, and landed in Paris, France. The aircraft that Lindbergh flew was called the Spirit of St. Louis. This aircraft, known by many as the Spirit, ended up completing 174 journeys 
and is currently preserved at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Another popular icon is a community symbol to the residents of Detroit, Michigan, and that's a 312-inch statue made of pure bronze, which is called the Spirit of Detroit, and is located in downtown Detroit. During the 2009 Stanley Cup, fi Stanley Cup Finals, the Detroit Red Wings hockey team created a special jersey for the bronze monument to wear in order to serve as a good luck charm and a sign of a hope for the community as the Red Wings were prepared to serve their, uh, defend their Stanley Cup trophy. Even during the holidays, we like to characterize this time of year as a spiritual time. Just this past week, we heard of the spirit of Halloween and to weeks, weeks to come, I'm sure we'll hear about the spirit of Christmas. My reason for telling you about these icons and habitual sayings is that the idea of spirit and labeling spiritual things has been an important part to American society and culture, regardless of an individual's religious beliefs or understanding spiritual things. Even some of us believers have a false understanding of what the true spirit of God looks like in our lives and what the Spirit has set us free from. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to grasp the understanding of the Holy Spirit, as it is a vital part of Galatians chapter 5. It's the Spirit in Galatians 5 that transforms our lives and gives us freedom to live the life God has called us to do. Jesus alludes to this truth in John chapter 8 when he says, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Being free in Christ is what makes this dispensation of grace so unique, and our freedom is the outward expression to what God has done for us on the cross. The question that so many Christians have to ask when dealing with this freedom is how do we use it? Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another in humbly love. The first thing that this passage tells us is that our freedom is something that is called by God for us to live out. Secondly, there is a way that God does not want us to use our freedom. That way is indulging in our sinful nature. This nature is our natural sinfulness is apart from Christ. This is what is naturally among us. This is who we are apart from Christ. And our freedom should not be used as an opportunity for the flesh. Paul lays out examples of what this sinful desire uh, looks like when he writes in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, Selfish ambition, dissension factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and that alike. When we are in Christ, we are people who are led by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we should overcome those things that are laid out in verses 19 through 21 through the Spirit of God. To be burdened by attaching yourselves to these fleshly desires is to be burdened by a yoke of slavery, as verse 1 commands us not to do. I believe our freedom in Christ is written clearly in Paul's letter to the Church of Rome. Turn with me to Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Follow along in the street if you will, too. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Paul writes, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all who were baptized into Christ Jesus were also baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death into order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of Father, we too may live a new life. This Galatians 5 passage and this Romans 6 passage have very much similar truths in it laid out, and that how we should live our lives and how we should not live our lives through this freedom. 
Paul wants our freedom as believers to be used to do away with sin and to not practice sin, as that was the old way in which we live. There's an old way and there's a new way. We now live in the new way through the Spirit of God, and our freedom needs to glorify our new way in which we live. As mentioned above, we do this by serving one another, just as Paul wrote in Galatians 5.13. I think a good start to practice humility in our service with one another is not regarding ourselves more highly than we ought to. Too often, I believe, our pride can blur us from this freedom to serve one another as we are blind to the sinfulness of our narcissism. One of my favorite activities is on Wednesday afternoons, as Pastor Gary mentioned, doing either a hospital or a home visitation with Pastor Joe. Some of you here have joined us during that time some of you have even been the ones that we visited. But the reason I enjoyed this so much is it's a time that I can see positive impact on those that we visit. And it's strictly because of the time that we spent with them. We don't have to buy them a gift or make them a meal, although those are great acts of serving. But in this case, time or being a good listener to someone who needs it can be a way of serving one another with humbly love. Our freedom is to be used to serve one another. How can we use our freedom to serve one another? It may look different uh, based on needs and others that we can provide. But when we are we are speaking the Spirit of God, when we are seeking the Spirit that is laid out in Galatians 5, and letting that transform our thoughts and our actions, we have freedom to put others before ourselves. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Another theme that Paul has used and stresses so much in Galatians chapter 5 is the idea that us believers in this administration of grace is the idea that we're not under the law anymore. The law or Mosaic law was the Ten Commandments that were given to Moses in Exodus chapter 20. The law was how the Jewish people were able to serve God, honor him, and to better know him. To better understand the law, we have to understand that a lot of Jewish people were basically slaves to obey the law. When I was in eighth grade, my history teacher every Friday would show the TV series Roots. And Roots was uh, about, Roots came out in 1977. Some of you may remember when Roots came out. 1977 Roots is about, it starts with a family in Africa and they colonized and comes to the United States around the 1750s, and it's a genealogy of the family as they are slaves here in the United States. And the main character who we see in the beginning is a gentleman by the name of Kunta Kinte. And Kunta Kinte and his family have really three things to do. Obey the law of their master, obey the master himself as a whole, and to continue to be slaves and servants to him. If we look to Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul says, do not be burdened by a yoke of slavery. A uh, yoke of slavery was a wooden yoke that was often something to be put on a group of oxen during Paul's time. And it was used to control in which the sheep walked. And a sheep had no choice but to obey. Picture of a yoke of slavery that was attached to, to an oxen. But our freedom in Christ and being apart from the law can be better understood if we take a step back and look in Galatians chapter 4. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 4, but we're going to look at verses 28 through 31. Galatians chapter 4, verses 28 through 31. Paul writes, Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with me the sons of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. So Isaac was the miracle son of Abraham and his wife Sarah, as they bore Isaac in their later years. But Abraham had a second son named Ishmael as well. Ishmael, however, was a product of Abraham's fornication, as he had sexual relations with a slave servant named Hagar. Abraham eventually cast out of the promised land both Hagar and Ishmael, 
As the promises of a blessed family line and inheritance of the promise was promised through Isaac and not Ishmael. Paul is saying in this passage that the freedom, that this freedom will prevail over slavery. But not only that, but Christians become Christians through a promise of God's grace that leads to freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaac came into this world as a result of promise to Abraham. Christians become Christians and live out the Christian life by the promise of God's grace. The central point in Isaac's birth is that the birth depended on God entirely, for it was the work of God and not the work of Abraham and Sarah. On the other hand, Ishmael's birth was strictly on the work of two humans. What we can take out of this passage and apply it to our Galatians chapter 5 passage is that we as believers should not follow legalism, the law, or the works for that matter, but God's grace. Grace or free-oriented people are people who trust in Christ alone and freely gives their lives based on that truth. They are therefore free in their relationship with God because of what Christ accomplished on the cross. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, Paul writes, Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Part of what was keeping the Galatian people from living a law of freedom was they were continuing to look for justification Justification is what is being made right in the sight of God by keeping and obeying the Mosaic law. More specifically, Paul is using this idea of circumcision and physical circumcision among males was specifically unique for the Jewish men to mark themselves as Jews and to symbolize their covenant and devotion toward God. Paul is telling us that these things don't matter at all. It's actually quite interesting that not only do these things not matter, but if we solely practice these things of the law of means of justification, we are actually moving further and further away from Christ and the gift of grace that he gives us. The truth is that Paul wants us to live by that which we have been purchased by Christ in order that we don't live as slaves, but of those who have been set free. This new life of freedom can be a hard one to live, and especially in a world that we live in today. Standing firm is our marching order in Galatians 1, chapter 1. Something that can hinder ourselves from living a life of freedom is letting condemnation hinder our faith and not being perfect at living out the Christian life. Paul writes, and turn to me now, with Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh... God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live accordingly to the flesh, but accordingly to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. There is a lot of rich material laid out here in uh, Romans chapter 8 that would take a whole other sermon to preach on. But we can see similar truths in this passage that are well found in Galatians chapter 5. Both of these passages teach that truth 
is in that the Spirit of God has set us free from the law of sin and death. And because of that, we should be free from the thoughts, not of feeling good, and free from the mindset of working to please God. They also show us that the law was powerless to save us from our sin, as the law was meant to recognize that we are sinners and we cannot completely obey the law. Because of this, we as believers are to live through the Spirit and not of the law. Because we have a sinful flesh nature that wants us to be opposite and contrary to God and the Holy Spirit, it can be confusing to actually live out fruitful lives that are glorifying to the Spirit and lives that are led in one step with the Spirit. During the summer months, I go back home to my home in Marquette, and I work different jobs this summer to make money to come back to school and to have money throughout the summer and the school year. And I've worked a different job, and one of my jobs that I've worked was I worked at a produce department at a grocery store. And one of the jobs that I had when I got to work was I were to go around and look at all the fruit that was bad in the different aisles, and I were to write down all the fruit that were bad. I was able to get a dumpster, like a, a dumpster I was able to put in the cart and put boxes in it. And I was able to go and take out all the bad fruit, and I was able to put it in the dumpster. And then I was able to throw it away in our huge trash can. And then I would write down the fruits that needed to be filled again. I would go in the back, find the fruits, and just within about 20 minutes, all the bad fruits were gone and were replaced with healthy, new, fresh fruit. And the fruit that is in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit, is there for us to see. And we've gotten over the types of sinful acts and behaviors that are classified as bad fruits in verses 19 through 21. But the Spirit of God only classifies the good fruits as one singular fruit of the Spirit. A common mistake we can make in our theology is referring to them as the fruits of the Spirit, when Paul specifically calls them the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When we let the Spirit control our lives and not the law of our own flesh, these are the results. Love. And that love creates unity, and to express love is to express the very character as, of God. As a, the Apostle John wrote, God is love. Joy, in which we look at our current circumstances with the lens of our hope being in our salvation. When we practice joy, our life circumstances and happiness have little to no correlation with each other. Because our joy is not set on things of this world. Peace is what we should possess with God and what we should have with others. If we are living our life with the Holy Spirit living inside of us, then we already have peace with God. As once we were reconciled back to Him because of what God had done through us with Christ Jesus on the cross. We are automatically at peace with Him. When we practice peace consistently, we will naturally become a person of peacemaking and a promoter of peace. Imagine how functional some of our churches would be if everyone strived to have peace with one another. The night Jesus was betrayed, he says, Peace I leave with you, peace I give to you. Not of the world gives, but of I give. So many times our world can promise peace in different things, but the reality is God himself will give us the peace and the only peace that we need and desire. Patience is being patient with everyone that we come in contact with because of how God has showed patience with us time and time again. Kindness is showing genuine compassion towards others. Goodness is our positive attitude that produces a person to do acts of kindness. <laughs> Faithfulness will be evident in the life of those who walk by the Spirit and their loyalty and commitment to both God and others. Gentleness is shown through the one who is in control of their emotions and is caring. Self-control is being made moderate in everything that they do. <coughs> Living our lives based on the fruit of the Spirit may seem like it's challenging or impossible at times. 
Remember that the fruit of the Spirit is contrary to the flesh, as verse 17 says. The two who are in a constant tug of war, if you remember Pastor Gary last week with his, his rope, and it's a constant tug of war of this battle between the flesh and the Spirit. And just because we have freedom doesn't mean we are to live our lives any way we want to. We have to repent of our sins and be willing to change the way we are living. That is why the Spirit of God gives you the power to surrender your life and to live upon the virtues of the Spirit of the Spirit when we submit to Him. To live a life of freedom is to live through the Spirit. If we believers are willing to walk and step with the Spirit, we will not be conceited in our thoughts and actions, but instead our sinful flesh will be transformed to live a life that reflects the virtues of the Spirit. Instead of giving a list to follow in Galatians 5, Paul gives us simple principles that allows us to personally apply the fruits of the Spirit to our lives and the choices that we make. The question some of you may be asking is, how can we love when we live in a world of hate? How can we be peacemakers in a world full of rage? I believe the answer to this question is found in Galatians chapter 5. As Paul does not want our flesh to be by the means in which how we live our lives, even if our flesh wants to be good. Instead, Paul is encouraging us to yield to the Holy Spirit in order to develop ourselves to live out personal application of the fruit of the Spirit in our own lives. I've mentioned a couple of times already, but all of this freedom and life through the Spirit is made possible through the cross of Christ. Paul mentions the cross in Galatians 5 when he says, 5 verses 11, Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. And later in verse 24, Paul alludes to the crucifixion as he writes, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The cross is what unites both man and God. Because of the cross, when the believer is walking in step with the Spirit and producing fruit, there is no room for envy and hate, as those virtues that were in, Gal in the Galatian church were facing, and that so many churches are, we are facing today in those struggles. The whole chapter of Galatians 5 is about being free to live the Spirit and to not worry about keeping the law and satisfying the desires of the flesh. You, personally, have been called to freedom. But now the commandment has stayed the same. To love God with all our hearts and to love others. As I just mentioned, it is the cross that reconciles mankind back to God. Mankind is separated by God because of sin. Christ, being the Son of God in His very nature, obeyed the calling of God completely, as well as obeyed the law perfectly. Christ died a painful and humiliating death on the cross, which was the worst type of execution by the Romans. The story doesn't end there, though. After three days later, Christ rose from the dead, conquering sin, evil, and death forever. There is nothing you can do to inherit eternal life on your own as we can only be saved through God's grace, through our faith. Jesus tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. In John 14, 6, he says that. And then Paul alludes in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, If we confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Once you are saved and the Holy Spirit lives within you, I believe that the scriptures teach that we are eternally secure and that nothing will pluck us from his hand. As you are leaving this morning, I want you, each and every one of you to be encouraged by Galatians chapter 5 and to live a life through the Spirit that frees you from the law of sin and death in which you may draw closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we are so thankful for you and the spirit that you give us to allow life that we can live through that spirit. 
Thank you for your love and the word that we can apply the teachings to our life. We are thankful that we don't have to obey the law or practice the things that are in it, but instead you give us freedom through your spirit to glorify you and honor one another. We thank you for this entire chapter of Galatians 5 that is still relevant 2,000 years later. Pray over each and every one of the individuals in this church this morning as they take a second look at their lives. They take a second look at are they living a life of freedom? Are they living a life to the spirit that we so clearly see in Galatians 5? I pray that they see that our salvation is found in God's grace, not our works. Bless this people. Bless this church. We pay us on our son's name. to learn to preach and to share God's word. What a wonderful place to do this. Troy, continue to preach the scriptures and continue to do what you did this morning. Bring us back to Jesus Christ. Bring us back to the gospel. That is a powerful message that needs to be heard today. We're blessed by hearing that. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, we'd like to invite you to come. Please believe and know that Christ died for your sins. Know that it's been taken care of. What you've just heard from Galatians 5 and Romans chapter 8, two of the great passages of Scripture. Somebody came to me this past week. We've been camping out in Galatians 5 for the last almost two months now. And they have memorized all of Galatians 5. And they said, can we memorize another chapter? Because they want to continue to memorize. Galatians chapter 5 and Romans chapter 8 are two passages that fit well together as we've been reminded today. If you'd like to memorize some more verses, I would encourage you to go to Romans chapter 8 and memorize that next chapter. As we continue our camping out here in Romans, uh, Galatians 5, we're going to spend the next three weeks going through these verses as we bring a conclusion to this series. But I encourage you, believers, take your Bible out and memorize as many of these verses as you can. Even just that first verse, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. That thought alone will help us as we walk through our faith today. Um, what I'd like to do this morning as we close, uh, Troy, Pastor Troy Sergi, uh, is going to be at the back door. We just called you Pastor. I don't know if you got that. Or not. <laughs> um, he's going to be at the back door, and when you leave, you have an opportunity to shake hands with him and greet him. He might not know who you are, so introduce yourself to him, and it would be well for you to just give a word of encouragement. We also have a number of you that are new to the congregation. We have a luncheon uh, that we've invited you to be a part of. We're going to be eating there at about 12.15. We don't need to rush, uh, but we will start our lunch for you folks that are invited. Uh, please join us at 12.15 uh, for lunch. It would be well for us this morning to end our time together standing and proclaiming the truth that he is exalted. And so let's stand together.